the mist of the Andean cloud forest in South America, there's a shy, mysterious beast. It's one of the largest animals in these forests, yet it's so elusive that until recently very little was known about it. Spectacled bear. Though glimpses of it in the wild are rare, it's far more familiar from a children's book. In 1958, a bear called Paddington from deepest, darkest Peru entered the lives of children across the world through the books of Michael Bond. There's only one bear in South America, the spectacled, so Paddington must be one. And in the book, at least, he eats marmalade. But to biologists, new, staggering revelations are now coming to light. Andes run the length of South America, and it's up in the central and northern Andes, close to the equator, that the bears live. Skirting the mountain peaks are thick, dense cloud forests, which rise up to about four and a half thousand meters. Being both high and on the equator, this is called the high tropics, rich in wildlife. This damp air creates perfect growing conditions. The branches of trees are festooned with flowering plants. The same bromeliads that attract hummingbirds also attract bears. Though both sexes of bear climb trees, the female bears, weighing a third less than the males, are able to reach the more inaccessible plants on the outer branches. Spectacled bears love bromeliads, and with their extraordinary sense of smell, find them up in trees. What they can smell is the plant's sugar-rich core. The bears are called spectacled because of the markings around their eyes. Actually, their sight isn't very good. They rely much more on their sense of smell. The faced bears became extinct, including a giant one that weighed more than a ton. Above the cloud forest, it's too cold for trees to grow. The land is carpeted with vast swathes of tall grasses called paramon. Puyas are ground bromeliads that grow out here on the Paramo and can stand over three meters high. The bears are lured out of the cloud forest to the sweet epicenters of the Puyas. Clearly this bear has a sweet tooth. Perhaps this is the basis for Paddington's love of marmalade. The bears are extremely well and live high in the mountains, so getting any information on them has always been hard. But what scientists were sure about was that almost all their diet was plants. Over the last few years, with cloud forests being cleared at an alarming rate, scientists have woken up to their plight. In Ecuador, biologist Armando Castellanos has devoted 12 years to finding out more about them. Although Armando has studied many animals in the cloud forest, his greatest passion has always been for the bears. Estudiar osos es muy difícil porque yo tengo que soportar situaciones muy adversas de clima como viento y lluvia. 
pero todo yo puedo olvidar cuando puedo ver un animal de esos caminando. Todo el cansancio se me va y yo puedo estar emocionado cuando veo caminando uno de esos animales. Radio collaring a wild bear that has been trapped and sedated. This is a large male bear. He also has collars on other animals so he can build up a picture of where the bears are and what they're doing. Oh, you can't. He hopes to find out, crucially, just how much ground the bears cover. Fue algo tan emocionante liberar un, un oso macho con collar porque fue la primera vez y se siente unas emociones tan encontradas. Armando isn't the only scientist in the Andes who's become obsessed by spectacled bears. Further south, on the dry, rugged foothills of Peru, spectacled bears are at the very edge of their range. This is where biologist Rob Williams works with the bears on a small reserve called Chaparri. Rob came out here from England as a bird-watching tour guide, married a Peruvian girl, and settled here to establish a community-owned reserve with his new father-in-law. When I first heard about spectacle birds, I guess, yeah, as a child, I don't remember the exact moment. I mean, everyone knows Paddington came from deep as dark as Peru. It was a mythical animal of the Andes that no one really saw or knew anything about. I came as an ornithologist interested in birds, but I, I wanted to see a puma, I wanted to see a spectacled bear, because these are the big, exciting animals. Though there were rumours of bears living in the Chaparri area, no one, including Rob, knew for sure whether they were still there. It was only when I started coming down here in about 1999, just off the peace agreement between Peru and Ecuador, that it became possible, and I, I started meeting people saying there are still spectacled bears in an area. And that became very interesting with the local people here and some other biologists. We started getting interested in them, thinking how they're still doing. It's amazing they're still here. But in such a vast landscape and with limited resources, how could Rob ever be able to find one, let alone learn anything about them? Remote cameras triggered by an infrared beam were a possible answer. Unlike people, they neither smell nor move and can remain unflinching night and day for weeks at a time. The dry riverbeds on the reserve always have a few remaining pools of water, and Rob knew that if the bears were there at all, they would come to drink sooner or later. Week after week, Rob and his team visited each camera trap in the mountains, returning to base with the crucial evidence on the memory cards. Gradually, we've built up a picture, and we know now there are nine or ten bears using this valley on a regular basis, probably five or six in it at any one time. The study continues, but it's slow. So Rob also values the information he's getting from a group of rescued bears, which live in an enclosure in the reserve. These bears have been rescued from captivity, illegally held in circuses, zoos, factories, sawmills, private people's houses. They have a better life here, we can learn stuff from them, but most importantly, the local community can come here and see the bears, and it creates a local source of respect. The camera traps have shown us that the behavior of the bears is quite different from what was widely believed. People believe they were probably nocturnal, it's published in several reports. But here we found that through the camera trapping there's no nighttime activity at all. <laughs> He's also witnessed something else which is quite extraordinary. The bears making beds in the trees.
Biologists haven't yet found a den, but mothers and their cubs have been observed to remain together for over a year. Two cubs is the norm. Not much more is known about their upbringing. Rob gets to know spectacled bears better. He's starting to understand how they survive here at the very edge of their range. In this habitat, especially in the dry forests, they're trapped in sort of the edge of their, their possible limit of, um, of survival, really. You know, this is an extreme environment for them. Their diet was thoroughly studied here 40 years ago. Scientists decided that these bears were mainly vegetarian, with protein from termites and beetles making up a scant 2% of their meals. Some Andean people, particularly those that keep livestock, believe that bears are even predatory. But this is something that scientists are quick to dismiss. In my years here and in other countries, I've heard many reports of amazing things from otherwise credible witnesses. The inbuilt beliefs and hatreds towards predators in Andean communities can often lead people to, to tell you things that they believe they have seen. There's a man in this community who's told me he's seen a peregrine cut the heads off four chickens with its wings. It's obviously rubbish. He's otherwise a very reliable observer. Rob thinks that scientists must stick to what they see. Here in Peru, even at the peak of the dry season, which lasts for three or four months of the year, when there's absolutely no fruit, no insects, no nothing, the La Beza Chaparri eat nothing more than bark. Their teeth can rip deep into the trunk of leafless pasayo trees where sugars are stored. And this is enough, amazingly, for the bears to survive. Interestingly, the bears seem to have a sixth sense for when and where to find fruiting trees. When these avero berries appear much lower down the mountain, the bears are soon onto them. Is it their sense of smell, or is information being passed down from mother to cub? Rob knows that bears quickly move into his area when fruits appear. However, he has no idea how much ground these same bears are also using outside the reserve. Back in Ecuador, this is exactly what Armando is trying to find out. Working at this altitude for weeks at a time is hard. A horse is the only way to get around up here. The horses on this ranch at Llana Urco are direct descendants of ones brought from Spain by the conquistadores, and 500 years of altitude have given them the lungs for the job. It's soon clear Armando will need stamina too. In this terrain, it's hard to pick up the signal from the radio collared bear. At this high spot, he ought to get a good signal. He needs line of sight to pinpoint the transmission from the collars. And in this terrain, that can be hard. Aunque es muy difícil seguir estos animales porque ellos se esconden en, en lugares muy apartados y distantes. Nosotros siempre queremos seguirlo. Aunque nosotros perdemos la señal, siempre nosotros queremos encontrarlos y se transforma en un reto seguir estos animales. Pero nunca queremos dejarlos y más bien siempre queremos seguirlos día tras día. It seems that his big male bear has moved over 15 kilometers in one day and is now heading northwest from the Paramo to denser terrain. But these deep valleys don't just make the signal difficult to find, they slow him right down. 
little. He gets the help of local flying enthusiast Jorge Anhalsen. Armando will take his receiver with him and be able to cover much more ground. Jorge does a final engine check. They'll be flying over terrain where an emergency landing will be impossible. Radio tracking from the air allows Armando to build up a picture of where his collared bears are moving. After several flights over a period of months, he's able to map the signals. He can see the entire range that the male bear has covered over that time. It is 16,000 hectares. That's half the size of the Isle of Wight. It's bigger than anyone had imagined. He's also discovered that within the same area, there are also two females. If a bear needs so much land to survive, then an encroachment on its territory puts it under enormous pressure. People are pushing further and further into remote areas, often clearing areas of once pristine cloud forest to graze their cattle. Every hillside that is cleared denies the bear a few trees dripping in bromeliads or a patch of sugar-rich puyas. The cattle are also being taken right up onto the high paramo. Scientists like Armando are eager to find out how the bears are coping with these changes. Back on the ground, Armando returns to the spot where he obtained the most recent signal. The signal is very strong. The frequency tells him it's the big male bear. It must be close, but a condor is circling. Though they're quite common here, to see them in flight like this generally indicates that there's a carcass around. Might his bear be dead? But suddenly the bear's signal strengthens and Armando gets a sighting. She is. Over there. Over there. It's alive and well. Armando tries to see where the bear is heading. It seems to be following a scent. A dead cow. And the bear seems very interested. To Armando's amazement, the bear starts to gorge on the belly of the cow. It's one more observation that has helped turn everything that we knew about spectacled bears on its head. Forget beetles and termites, this bear clearly has a taste for raw steak too. This extraordinary sighting encourages Armando to continue his trek across the Paramo. The ground has been trodden down. 
It seems that something big has been dragged down the hill. And not 50, nor 100, but 200 meters down the hill. Armando follows the trail down. At the end of it is another carcass. It's another dead cow. There are tooth marks of bear and claw marks too. There are well-known cattle killers up here, cumas. But it's still surprising to find a spectacled bear scavenging on one of their kills. Perhaps the bears are being pushed into scavenging meat because their habitat is being broken up. It's difficult for Amando to assess what bears normally do in the wild. To study the bear's natural diet, Amando has started visiting a much more pristine, unspoilt part of Ecuador. It's a place so remote, it takes days from Quito in a Land Rover, and then more days on horseback. A dangerous journey along treacherously steep ridges to the wild, pristine foothills of Mount Sangai. And no one comes here for a very good reason. Every now and then, quite randomly, it erupts. The locals won't come within miles of here. Armando knows what he's looking for. This is dense, pristine cloud forest, and Armando can recognize the trail left by spectacled bears as they move through it. After many hours of searching, he finds a vital clue. The feces, or scats, of a bear. And in it, hairs. Armando is sure that these hairs belong to the mountain tapir. Mountain tapirs are indigenous to the cloud forests of the Andes. They're about the size of donkeys, but because they are good to eat, have been hunted out of most of their former range. But at Mount Sangai, where there are absolutely no people, the tapirs are abundant. For Amanda, it's a revelation that spectacled bears have probably always scavenged on carcasses, on indigenous creatures such as mountain tapir, which were here long before cattle. But this revelation also makes him reconsider a lot of other assumptions he's held about spectacled bears. Like Rob Williams in Peru, Amanda has been ignoring the local campesinos' rather wild claims that bears were attacking live cattle. He puts out the word that he would like to hear from anyone making these kinds of claims. Senora, ¿se acuerda? ¿Cómo está? ¿Se acuerda de lo del a woman responds. She lives in a region of Ecuador called Cosanga. She recounts to Armando something extraordinary she saw down by the river. El tapir? cruzó el río y el oso venía atrás del, del tapir el, el tapir seguía yeah. se fue al, al seguido al río uh, se fue y él también el, el oso le seguía atrás y brincaba más o menos así ya yeah. así yeah. el tapir el, y el oso se escaparon the tapir and bear uh, escape when uh, they see her if he had met this lady before he had been to Sangai, he would have dismissed her assumption that the bear was actually attacking the tapir. 
But knowing now that some bears have a taste for raw meat, we can't help but wonder whether there's more to this bear than scientists have ever believed. Less than 30 kilometers away, but still in the same region, Kasanga, a campesino is keen to take Amando up the hill to the clearings in the forest made. Two attacks, allegedly by bears, only 30 kilometers apart. That's within the home range of one hungry male bear. Could it be that spectacled bears, like grizzly bears, are attacking and killing large mammals? If true, this would be shocking news for the scientific community. And there are scientists, like Rob Williams in Peru, who don't believe the evidence stacks up. The spectacle bear is a small bear. The biggest ones are reported in are about 120, 130 kilos. A cow weighs about four times what a spectacle bear weighs. That's a huge difference. There's very few predators in the world that take out prey alone that are that much bigger than them. They believe what they're telling you, but actually, when you actually say whose cow has been killed, it's the neighbor of my cousin's friend. And, you know, I want to see someone, why has no one actually proven it? No one's ever actually shown us a dead cow and said, and we've got there in time and said, yes, a bear killed this cow. But in a remote part of Ecuador, that's exactly what people are saying. a remote community at a place called Oyakachi. Isaac Goldstein is a Venezuelan biologist following the same leads as Amanda. Isaac has been investigating claims about bear attacks on cattle across the bear's range in Venezuela and Bolivia, as well as here in Ecuador. Isaac listens carefully to what the people at Oyacachi have to say. They've told these stories many times, but few people have believed them. Bueno, nosotros veníamos de en el, o sea, eh, o sea, veníamos del páramo. Eh, tuvimos que presenciar el ataque del oso, casi de una distancia de 500 metros. Entonces tuvimos que observar al oso que estaba aplastando al ternero en esta parte. Entonces nosotros tuvimos que acercar a la, al ternero afectado y tuvimos que observar que en esta parte había eh, un hueco con todos los huesos había comido. Entonces ellos no creían lo que nosotros habíamos visto. The, the Ministry of Environment didn't believe that the bear was attacking a cow. The only known conflict with bears is that they are spotted in fields of maize. Maize is increasingly grown in forest clearings and looks like the tall puya that the bears love to eat anyway. So people and bears are in conflict already. If people are also talking about bears attacking cattle, what hope is there of local people caring for this bear? Dennis Torres works for a conservation organization called Andigina and thinks that local people are being swayed by a long-held mistrust of bears. The campesinos believe the spectacle bear is a real predator because they have a lot of misconception. Maybe it's the heritage for the Spanish people. When they are coming to South America, they have a long history of conflict with brown bears in, in Spain or in Europe. 
But scientists are going to have to get to the truth, and fast, because local people are already taking the law into their own hands. Hunting is thought to be one of the major causes of population reduction. Nearly 200 bears are shot each year, even though they're an endangered species. The bear's reputation as a crop raider is bad enough, and Egina don't want its image to be tarnished any further. They make no mention of the stories of bears hunting down cattle. The farmer living here in this area has seen constantly one spectacle bear close to his farm. And he told me, I don't have any problem related with cattle predation. Uh, in fact, the spectacle bear is very close to my home, but I don't have any problem with the bear. Sometimes the bear is eating the, the corn in my crops, but I don't feel afraid about the bear or any bad image about the bear. But this approach is causing a rift with biologists. I get very mad at them because they, they are preaching what they would like to happen in the world, but that's not what is happening. Buenas tardes, ¿cómo están? Mucho gusto. Mi nombre es Denis Torres. Voy a dejar un material que acabamos de producir. If we go to a settlement that is having problems, and we say to the cattle owner, you have no problem, we will lose all the credibility because we will be liars. They know what they are seeing. They are experts on their cattle. The campesinos believe the, the bear is the main reason for the cattle loss. I am not very sure about that. I think the, the puma is the main animal provoking the cattle death. At Oyakachi, Isaac Goldstein is increasingly convinced that it's not a puma, but a bear that's attacking and killing their cattle. <laughs> okay, we can see here clearly the claw marks of the attack. Very superficial, however. This is the only profound one. We don't see anything here in the base of the skull or the throat, so it is not a puma attack. And the mother of this calf is missing. So we should look for her and see and to confirm the bear attack. We will look for the remains of the mother and confirm the bear attack. The owner of these cattle, called Melchor, continues alone in the search for his missing cow. Following hoof marks and disturbed vegetation, he enters the cloud forest. He soon identifies an area on the ground within the forest where there has been a huge struggle. The ground has been kicked up and there are traces of hairs. He found a dead cow, one of his cows dead, another sign of struggle. He followed the signs of dragging. And then at the end of the sign, he found the dead cow. From what she, Isaac believes he's now building up the profile of a bear attack, a series of distinctive clues. He followed other trails, and at the end of one of those, he found a big brown nest with scuds and uh, claw marks on trees. These claw marks tend to appear on trees less than a hundred meters from where a bear has fed. Armando saw them at Kosanga. Is this where little Paddington sharpened his marmalade spoon into a butcher's knife? There's even more emphatic evidence to come. He's telling me that he have had previous attack on his cattle and showing me a picture and, and here you can see the typical side where the bears attack cattle. Isaac is now in no doubt. 
there is a totally different behavior between a puma kill and a spectacle bear kill. The puma kill, you see all the evidence in the throat. That's the kill of, of a puma. There's no way, no way you can mistake one kill from the other. There is no way. And these are the same wounds that Armando saw in the photos at Kosanga. It's like solving a criminal case with humans. You don't have to see the guy shooting at the person. You solve the problem with the evidence. But down in Peru, Rob Williams remains cautious. In Chaparri, he has absolutely no evidence that bears kill other animals, so he prefers to understate the claims. It is interesting, these, these new studies and the new evidence. It is showing us new aspects of the... I think we need to be very careful with what we do with any information that comes out about predation and this bear. We've got to obviously report it. You've got to be, as a scientist, factual. But we've got to put it into context that it may happen in area, some areas, but in other areas it isn't happening. And it may be, at worst, a few individual bears that learn this. In the Andes, for many years, people have said they're they're evil predatory animals and we we need to be sure that they really are predatory and think about solutions to the problem not just say they're predatory and create a worse press for the bear because in the main and in many areas like this they are not taking cattle Isaac agrees that it might not be a problem everywhere but he thinks it's time to face up to what's going on we cannot say that it, it is a widespread behavior and that in all localities all bears attack cattle but in certain localities certain bears become a problem and we have to deal with that problem the problem is how you keep the cattle away from the bears and the bears away from the cattle that's the main problem One solution might be to bring llamas and guanacos back to the northern Andes. Unlike cattle, they're native to the Andes and have shared the mountains with bears for millennia. They might be better than cows at scrambling off steep slopes when chased by a bear. Another solution to the conflict might be to manage the cattle better, fence them into the lower slopes, or even pay out compensation money when cows are lost. It's unfortunate that the only reason we're having problems is because we've encroached on the bear's world. The more we learn about the spectacled bear, the more intriguing we find them to be. They're surviving by changing their behavior as we replace their forest foods with cows. They're doing their level best to hang on. Are we doing our best to help them? It would be a very sad world if we can't live with spectacle bears, with the 6,000, 10,000 spectacle bears, if we can't find a space for them in six Andean countries. The spectacle bears, the big terrestrial animal in many of these habitats. If we can't protect that, then we'll lose the next one down, then we'll lose the next one down, and we'll end up with a poorer, simpler ecosystem. Hopefully, with increasing knowledge, will come a better understanding of how we might take better care of this, the original Paddington bear.